Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Today, as I hope you know, is the fourth day of Hanukkah. Tonight at sundown, we'll be lighting the fifth candle as we begin the fifth night. And so I hope you're going to be with us uh, for that uh, whole afternoon this evening, uh, today. We had a great Hanukkah skit uh, and songs earlier in the service. We're having a Hanukkah concert today at 2 o'clock, and a Hanukkah party this afternoon, and special Hanukkah teachings. And at a sundown at about 5 o'clock, we're all going to be lighting our Hanukkiah. So I hope you brought your Hanukkiahs with the five candles. And so because of all this, today I want us to look at Hanukkah and the end times. And we call this a blueprint for the end times. So turn with me to the scriptures if you have the book of Daniel. The prophet Daniel, uh, chapter 12, Daniel 12, beginning in verse 1. And, and uh, Daniel says this, or God says this through Daniel. At that time, Michael, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, he will arise. And there'll be a time of distress, such as hadn't happened from the beginning of the nations until now. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, they will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting shame and contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the heavens, and and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there, and knowledge will increase, How long will it be before all these astonishing things are fulfilled? It'll be for time, times, and half a time. Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified and made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And the daily sacrifice will be abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation will be set up. The story of Hanukkah contains a prophetic, eschatological, end times, last days revelation. In fact, of all the Jewish holidays throughout the year, Hanukkah is the most explicit shadow and picture of the end times. Hanukkah contains the keys to where we're living right now. And so by studying Hanukkah, we can begin to unlock some of these keys. The events of Hanukkah happened in what's called the intertestamental period, after the closing of the the Tanakh, the Old Testament canon, and before the events of of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. It's prophesied, as as we're going to see in the book of Daniel, and it's also expressly referenced, as we read earlier, in the Gospel of John, in John 10.22. The story of Hanukkah begins with Alexander the Great uh, ruling the world. He's rising on the world stage. He conquers much of the known world, including the medial Persian Empire, which includes Judah, Israel, And after his death, his empire is divided up among his four top generals, just as was prophesied by Daniel in the picture of the four leopard with four heads. The two most powerful of these four kingdoms to emerge from dividing up Alexander's empire, his world empire, were the Seleucids uh, in Assyria and the 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 Ptolemies in Egypt. Uh, Cleopatra, for example, was the Ptolemy. She was not Egyptian. Uh, But in the Assyrian kingdom, in about 175 BC, uh, there arose a ruler named Antiochus, who later added the title to his name, Epiphanes, meaning God manifest. He's known as the Antichrist or the false messiah of the Old Testament. Antiochus wanted a one-world system, a one-world culture and religion. Everyone would have to follow the ways of the Greeks and worship the, the Greek gods. He especially hated the Jews and outlawed Judaism. He attacked Jerusalem in 168 B.C., He killed 80,000 Jews and sold another 40,000 into slavery. Uh, He made it punishable by death to read the Torah, uh, to observe the Shabbat, to circumcise your sons, to practice Judaism. He pillaged the temple. He dedicates the temple to Zeus. Uh, He erects an idol of Zeus in the temple, and he places his own face on the statue of Zeus. Uh, Daniel calls this the abomination of desolations. He turns the holy temple of God into a pagan temple offering up sacrifices of the Greek gods in the temple. 
He also purposely then further defiles the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar and sprinkling the blood of the pig over the entire temple and all the sacred vessels. He outlaws the Jewish feasts. He substitutes for them the drunken reveries of Dionysus and Bacchus, forcing the Jews to, to worship these gods uh, and to partake in, in their drunken debauchery. Women caught circumcising their sons had to witness their own infants murdered, then the corpses hung around their own necks. Jews refusing the sacrifice to the Greek gods were roasted alive on flat irons after their tongues were first cut out. Many Jews heroically resisted, but many went along with it. Many were actually eager to assimilate and to adopt the Greek Hellenistic ways and were happy to cooperate with it. So there were basically three camps. Those who resisted uh, the ways of the Greeks, those who embraced it, uh, and the vast majority who didn't do anything but just, just went along with it. Greek practices infiltrated the whole nation. Gymnasiums were set up everywhere, even in the shadow of the temple, where the athletes competed in the nude, uh, worshiping uh, the human body as, as a god. All to, to the Greek gods were erected everywhere. Jews were required to offer sacrifices to them on pain of death. Uh, the choice was either to commit idolatry or to die. And, and first, have your entire family killed before your very eyes. The book of Maccabees, we recounts this and put it on the overhead. It says this, uh, on the 15th day of the month of Kislev in the year 145, the king, Antiochus, erected the horrible abomination upon the altar of offerings, causing the temple to become desolate. This is the abomination of desolations. It goes on to say, in the surrounding cities of Judah, they built pagan altars, they burnt incense, and they burned the scrolls of the Torah of Moses. Antiochus Epiphanes, he's a forerunner, he's a type of the false messiah to come. Indeed, both are actually called the little horn in the book of Daniel. And Yeshua links the two of them together in Matthew 24, warning the Jews there'll be another abomination of desolations. Uh, they will be erected in the temple in the future in the end times. And he, he warns the people, the people to flee from it uh, when it comes. At the height of the Greek conquest of Israel, it looked like this is the end of Judaism, the end of the Jewish people, the end of the Bible. There'd be no Jewish people for a future Messiah to be born into. Without Hanukkah, there is no future Messiah. But God had other plans. From the hill country of Judea, there arose a priestly family of Hasmoneans. The father was Metatias. Uh, he had five sons. They refused to abandon or to compromise their faith in God and his ways and his word, and refused to assimilate to the Greek ways or, Greek, or worship the Greek gods. They realized they would have to take a stand. They would have to fight if they were to survive. They became warrior priests. They revolted against the Greek occupation. And they killed the Greek soldiers in the little town of Moedin, and they fled to the hills. Antiochus sends his army against them. They were outnumbered, outmanned, outskilled, outweaponed. The Greeks even sent elephants, the, the, their equivalent of modern-day tanks, <laughs> to lead the attack. And yet, miraculously, the Jews won battle after battle. So a larger army was sent against them. And again, against all odds, miraculously, they won again. They became known as the Maccabees, or the Hammers. The youngest son, Judah Maccabee, became their leader. And Tychus sends yet a larger army against them, but the Maccabees defeat them. The Maccabees prayed before every battle, and in faith, it didn't matter how few they were compared to the Greeks, because God was with them. And Tychus, he finally realizes his defeat. He withdraws from Israel. The Maccabees make their way up to the temple, find it desolate, polluted, defiled, ritually unclean, impure, they tear down all the idols, including the abomination of desolations. They remove all the, all the defiled altars and vessels. They clean and they purify and they consecrate the bed of Migdash, the temple. They relight the menorah, the lampstand, and the holy place. They rededicate the temple to the Lord for eight days, modeled on the eight days of Sukkot, which Sukkot, well, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, which they had been unable to celebrate. The nation was restored and rededicated to God. So the feast was called Hanukkah, meaning dedication. Now, we're going to see that hidden inside Hanukkah is a revelation for the end times and the strategy for how we, as end time believers, can overcome. Because the book of Daniel not only prophesies the events of Hanukkah, it also prophesies the events of the end times as well. Daniel speaks of both Antiochus, 
and also the final false messiah, the final antichrist yet to come. Because Hanukkah is a foreshadow of the end. Just consider the story of Hanukkah. Think about it. Uh, an age of apostasy, a rise of a man of sin who calls himself God, erecting an idol in the temple known as the abomination of desolations, making laws declaring faith in God illegal, persecution against God's people, a war against the saints. Notice all the parallels between Hanukkah and the book of Revelation. Hanukkah is a foreshadow of the last days. Indeed, here's another parallel. How long will this abomination of desolations last? How long will the worst of the tribulation and the abolishing of the sacrifices and Antiochus erecting in the temple this idol of Zeus with his own face on it and the final false messiah, this man of sin, hindering the temple, him declaring himself to be his God? How long will it all last? The book of Daniel says time, times, and half a time. The reference to time here in this context means a year. So time, times, and half a time is three and a half years. In the same way, we read this in Revelation 11, verse 2. And we'll put it on the overhead. Revelation 11 says, The Gentiles will trample down the holy city for 42 months. And I'll appoint my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy for 1260 days. This is a parallel to the book of Daniel, where the enemies of God trample down the temple. Here they are trampling down the holy city of Jerusalem for how long? 42 months, which is three and a half years. The two witnesses prophesied for how long? 1260 days, which is three and a half years. Now, how long historically did Antiochus stop the temple sacrifices in the story of Hanukkah until the Maccabees finally re restored the temple and restored the sacrifices? The book of Maccabees reveals to us exactly it was three and a half years. In the book of Revelation, we're told the false messiah will trample down the holy city for three and a half years. And the temple will be, will be desecrated for the same amount of time as it was in Hanukkah. Revelation 12 speaks of a woman who's a picture of the nation of Israel who will be persecuted by the dragon, Satan, and she'll flee into the wilderness for how long? 1260 days, the book of Revelation says, or three and a half years. The same length of time the temple was desecrated at Hanukkah. Hanukkah concerns an evil man who desecrates the temple, and likewise the end times concerns an evil man called the beast or the Antichrist who desecrates the temple, sets up an idol, the abomination of desolation, same as Hanukkah. Indeed, in the Olivet Discourse, what does Yeshua say in Matthew 24, verse 15? He says, so, well, when you see uh, standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, this already happened. Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled in Hanukkah. But Yeshua is saying here in Matthew 24, it will happen again in, greater, in even greater fulfillment in the last days, in the great tribulation before Yeshua returns. The Antichrist, the beast, will set up his last days of abomination of desolation. Look at Revelation 13, beginning in verse 1. The dragon, Satan stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast, uh, the false messiah, coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns, and he said it had a blasphemous name. The people worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth word of proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise its authority for forty-two months." 42 months, the same as the number for Hanukkah, the number for Antiochus, the number for the abomination. This is also the number for the rule of the false messiah, the Antichrist. Again, linked to the length of the persecution of the trampling down of the holy city of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple. Then in Daniel 9, we're given the timing of the coming of Messiah. Right? Both, both, both of his comings, actually. Daniel actually uses the Hebrew word Mashiach. He gives us this mathematical calculation of 70 weeks of years, or 77, or 490 years. It's actually broken down between 69 weeks and, and the final week. And if you work out the math, it comes to approximately 30 AD, the exact time of Yeshua's death and resurrection, that Messiah will come. But then Daniel says this, in verse 26, Daniel 9, 26. Afterwards, after the 69 sevens, Messiah will be put to death and have nothing. The people of the prince to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The angel Gabriel tells Daniel, Messiah will come to Jerusalem and be killed. 
and then Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed by the people of the prince who is to come. But we know who destroyed Jerusalem and who destroyed the temple in the year 70. They were the Romans. Daniel 9.26 speaks of the people, the Romans, of the prince who will come in the end of days. During the seventh and final week or period of seven years of Daniel's prophecy. The prince who is to come, this Antichrist, will be, um, we're being told here, he'll in some way that he'll be linked to Rome. Now I know that there are also out there uh, recently some theories of an Islamic Antichrist. Uh, but here in Daniel 9.26, pretty clearly says that the false Messiah will in some way be linked to Rome. Daniel 9.27, he, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, a period of seven years. In the middle of the seven, three and a half year mark, same time as Hanukkah, he'll put an end to the sacrifices and the offerings. And at the temple, he will set up the abomination of desolations. We see the events of Hanukkah and the events of the book of Revelation all converging and repeating the same cycle, fulfilling the same prophecies again on, on many levels. Notice here that the Antichrist will cause the sacrifices to cease. He'll set up this abomination of desolations for three and a half years and, and, the, the, and the exact same reenactment of Hanukkah. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, if you want to understand the last days, you've got to understand Hanukkah. What is the setting of Hanukkah? What sets the stage? An evil is overtaking the land. A new morality is seeking to eradicate God's moral law. A new faith is imposed upon the people from the outside. But many are glad to go along with it. And they're only too eager uh, to assimilate, uh, to follow the Greek ways and the customs. This evil, in the, this evil in the story of Hanukkah seeks to make all people abandon God and the Torah and circumcision and the Shabbat, they're all made illegal. Ultimately, a war is declared on all believers. Persecution arises. An evil leader arises called Antiochus Epiphanes, God manifest. The temple is desecrated. All of this is Hanukkah. And it matches up in an uncanny way with the book of Revelation. Also, in many ways, what's happening right now in our world. And Hanukkah all begins with Antiochus' decree that he wants all peoples under his rule to become one people with one culture and one language and one religion. One new world order. Uh, one world government. Uh, in the same way the book of Daniel says the fourth and the final kingdom, this revived Roman Empire, will take over the whole earth. One world empire again. Look at Daniel 7, 23. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It'll be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth. It'll take over the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. We read the same thing in the book of Revelation, describing a time when the entire world will be as one. Revelation 13, verse 7. The beast was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. Again, all the earth. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life the Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. The book of Revelation calls this Antichrist kingdom, it calls it spiritual Babylon. Babylon is the symbolic name of the chief city and represents the chief spirit behind it. Babylon is simply the Greek way of saying the Hebrew word Babel, Babel, as in the Tower of Babel. Europe is very significant in all of this. Because we just read in Daniel 9, 26, 27, that in the last days, this one world empire will in some way be linked to Rome, the people of the prince who is to come, to the Roman Empire. Revelation 17, 9 also speaks of a city on seven hills on whom this woman Babylon, this great prostitute, sits. Well, Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Revelation 17, 18. The woman you saw who rides the beast is a great city that rules over all the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, verse 5, this title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people, the blood of all those who bear testimony to Yeshua. Daniel also prophesies that the two of the four kingdoms to come, depicted here with the, uh, I'm sorry, in Daniel 2, he, he depicts these four kingdoms to come. He depicts them uh, as this giant statue in, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. The fourth and final kingdom in Daniel's prophesy, prophecy is clearly Rome. So in some way, he says, in the last days, there'll be a revival of the Roman Empire, 
which is spiritually called Babylon in the book of Revelation, due to the spirit behind it. But in the end, in Daniel's prophesy, the stone, which symbolizes the Messiah, it comes and it smashes the statue. And it smashes all the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, and when he smashes this fourth kingdom, Rome, notice also that the gold, the silver, the bronze, all the other kingdoms are smashed at the same time. So all the kingdoms, including Babylon, represented by this head of gold, are also present still at the end times in some way. It's almost as if the statue represents one empire. It's Rome at the end, yes, but at the same time, Babylon is still there. Ultimately, this represents the empire of man. It's a picture of fallen man. And the DNA from Babylon continues on all the way down to Rome. And the last days revived Roman Empire. Now, the majority of the Roman Empire, especially the western half of the Roman Empire, with its headquarters in Rome, occupied much of what is now Europe. Europe is the heir to Rome. The Bible says in the end of the age, there'll be some kind of confederacy of powers. And the nations of Europe, by the way, have never come together until now. Uh, with the EU, with the European Union, with the single currency of the euro. And the instrument that actually began the European common market was signed in Rome. It's called the Treaty of Rome. Europe is the heir to the old Roman Empire. Now, interestingly, when the EU and the European Union was formed, it chose for itself two symbols. The first symbol it chose was a woman riding a beast. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. <laughs> Just like we see in Revelation chapter 17, a woman symbolizing the spirit of Babylon, riding a beast, the Antichrist. The EU symbol is a woman riding the beast. It actually comes from what's called the myth of Europa. Europe takes its name from this ancient myth in which this woman, Europa, is seduced by this god Zeus, the same god worshipped by Antiochus in the story of Hanukkah. And in this myth, Zeus takes on the form of a bull or a beast. And Europa rides away with him, riding on his back. Hence, the symbol of Europe being a woman riding the beast. The myth speaks of someone being seduced by a false god and worshiping him. And that is the symbol for Europe. That's where Europe, the name of Europe, gets its name. That's the symbol the European Union chose for itself. What about the second image? The second image they chose for the EU, again, I'm not making this up, the second image they chose is the Tower of Babel. Babylon, amazing with the insignia, out of many shall come one. Meaning that we, the EU, will unite the entire world into one world system, one world government. The last time the world was united was in Babylon, at the Tower of Babel, when everyone spoke the same language. And they said, we will ascend up to the heavens. We'll be like God. In the Babylonian language, Babel means the gate of God. But in Hebrew, the word means confusion. <laughs> so what's the spirit behind the end times, uh, new world order. It's the spirit of Babel. It's the spirit of Babylon. Man wanting to be as God. The same thing that the serpent told Eve in the garden. Eat from this tree, you'll be like God. This is linked to Hanukkah and to Antiochus, who calls himself Epiphanes, God manifest. He sets up his idol of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, puts his own face upon it. And it's linked to the final end times, anti-Messiah. Uh, well, we're told this in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 4. It says that, that he, this man of sin, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or worshipped. So he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you see the links between Hanukkah and the end times Antichrist? These exact parallels. What is the number of the false messiah? We all know the number, 666. Six is the number of man, repeated three times. Three, three is the number for God. This Antichrist is man claiming to be God counterfeiting the true Messiah, who is God, who becomes in the form of a man. Big difference. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you about the coming of the Lord, for the day will not come until the apostasy, the great falling away, occurs, and the man of sin is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. The story of Hanukkah speaks of Antiochus, this picture of the false Messiah, trying to unite the world, when this happens, the spirit of the Antichrist takes over. An Antichrist, he's, a, he's satanically inspired, he tries to wipe out the people of God. And so even today, as, as globalism advances, as this, the whole world system is turning more and more against the Jews and against believers. Like with the Tower of Babel, the whole world in the end times will unite, yes, but not uniting under God. We see this beginning already today. 
even our, with even our own Western civilization becoming not only non-Yeshua based, but even anti-Yeshua. Indeed, you can't even mention the name of Yeshua in, in a positive way in the public media today without you being immediately criticized and censored. The spirit of Antichrist comes against true Yeshua followers. As we approach the end times, we see a growing anti-Yeshua culture throughout the world. Persecution is going to force the nominal believers to abandon the, the pretense of their faith. And the shallow, superficial believers will not stand in the day of persecution. When everyone who calls upon the name of Yeshua and who truly follows him is going to have to pay a price. People will also more and more abandon biblical marriage and, and, and the family. Everything of God is more and more going to be abandoned. Now, Europe is already far down this road. You know, uh, when the EU was putting together its constitution, describing its history and its heritage, it did not have one mention of Christianity. Can you believe that? Because the whole history of Europe is centered on Christianity. Yet they didn't even mention it. Recently in Western Europe, they actually imprisoned the pastor for preaching the gospel. We're not talking here about the days of the Iron Curtain uh, or, the, or, or, or communism. We're talking about modern Western Europe. True believers in Europe are becoming more and more marginalized. In France, the state police monitor what's said in evangelical churches. Yeah. Now, you'd expect this in China, you know, North Korea, but not in France. Yeah. And the more Europe merges into a single superstate, the more anti-Yeshua and anti-Jewish it will become. In some ways, you know, it's, it's, it's worse have, having been a Christian society like Europe than, than, and then becoming unchristian than never having been, been it at all. So too, as we in America turn more and more away from God, we as Christians and Jews and Messianic believers, we will be persecuted. Indeed, the scriptures tell us this. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Messiah Yeshua will be persecuted. Another parallel between Hanukkah and the end times, there'll be many who claim to follow God who actually collaborate with the evil empire. The Maccabees, you know, they opposed not only the Greeks, they also opposed their fellow Jews who, co who cooperated and collaborated with Antiochus uh, to oppose the ways of the Lord. In fact, the majority of the Jews didn't, did not rise up against Antiochus. It was actually a very small remnant. Most people were looking out for themselves and refused to take a stand. And that's how evil advances, when good people do nothing. Even many of the religious leaders and the priests went along with the Hellenization of Israel. The priesthood was contempt, was, was corrupt. The high priest actually led the Greeks into the Holy of Holies. So also in the end times, many so-called believers and religious leaders will go along with the apostasy and will cooperate with the Antichrist system. We already see this today with many historic mainline Protestant churches who no longer believe in the supernatural or in sin or repentance or the resurrection or in the Bible or as literally being true. Once you no longer believe the word of God, uh, God, the Lord will give you over. He gives you over to a spirit of deception. He gives you over to strong delusion and to blindness. So don't blindly follow the ways of the majority. The majority are usually wrong. <laughs> Most of the Germans followed Hitler. Most of the German pastors followed Hitler. When it's costly to stand for Yeshua, only the remnant will stand. Because most people refuse to pay the price. But the book of Maccabees says this, and we'll put it on the overhead. It says, uh, any of the scrolls of the law that they found, they tore up and burnt. Whoever was found with the scroll of the, of the covenant, who, and whoever observed the law, was condemned to death by royal decree. The spirit of Antichrist opposes the word of God. And so today, we're seeing this concerted effort more and more uh, to remove the word of God from our culture. It began way back in 1962 and 63 with, with prayer and then the Bible is being removed from the schools. But 50 years later, we've gone so far by today, it's hard even to picture the Bible ever having been read in schools. Because we are no longer a nation that honors God. Later on, the Ten, the Ten Commandments were removed from the courthouses and the government buildings. And today, you can't even say the name of Yeshua in a public radio or television without being mocked or criticized. You know, in Colorado, a law was recently passed that made the distribution of any literature discriminatory against homosexuals illegal. Uh, they, this, this literally makes it illegal to preach from or distribute the Bible because the gay activists claim that it's discriminatory against them. Of course, the Bible is not discriminatory against anyone. 
It's discriminatory only against sin. But do you see how a court could easily use this law to ban the Bible? The day is coming sooner than you think. Just as Antiochus outlawed the word of God, and the last days were moving towards that very same outcome. It's amazing how in so many ways the story of Hanukkah provides the template, uh, the blueprint, the pattern for the end times. Hanukkah also featured Antiochus desecrating the temple, setting up an idol, sacrificing a pig on the altar. Hanukkah involves a spirit of desecration. So too today, in the end times, we're seeing more and more a spirit of desecration of the things of God. The spirit of Antichrist desecrates that which is holy. It profanes that which is holy, and it sanctifies and uplifts that which is profane. Uh, it used to be you know, that curse words uh, were taboo in, in, in public media, but now it's turned on its head. You know, profanity is fine, but Yeshua is a curse word. Likewise, traditional marriage is, is profaned and desecrated today. Recently, the Smithsonian Museum, which is supposed to be the repository of American values, for the first time decided to have a gay exhibit in which it featured a crucifix, the symbol of Yeshua, being crawled all over by ants. Interesting, isn't this? Think about this. What is the connection? Why would an exhibit of gay themes have such a blatant hostility against Yeshua? Because it's spiritual. There's an anti-Yeshua spirit behind the gay movement. Can you imagine an American museum featuring an exhibit of ants crawling all over the image of Mohammed? They wouldn't dare, that, dare to do that, would they? And of course, the gay movement would never do it either because it's not an anti-Islamic spirit that's fueling them. It's an anti-Yeshua spirit. You know, government funds also paid for, this is years ago now, paid for a famous uh, gay artist's exhibit of a crucifix submerged in a jar of urine. Again, we're seeing the defiling of the holy. And we're seeing all over our, our entire culture more and more worshiping and celebrating that which is vile and immoral. Here's another parallel. In Hanukkah, Antiochus outlawed circumcision. Did you know that in California, they recently tried to pass a law outlawing circumcision? Yeah. And almost passed. Almost. <laughs> the only reason it wasn't passed, they were threatened with lawsuits by the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, this law was actually pushed in the California legislature by the homosexual lobby. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of Antiochus. And you know, in California public schools, they've now mandated in, in, in elementary schools heavy courses of indoctrination into the gay agenda, and they've told the parents, you have no right this time, you have no ability to pull your kids out from these classes. In other words, they're saying, we, the state, are the real owners of your children. We direct their lives and their education, not you. Can you imagine, even 50 years ago, this happening in our country? Did you know that the American public schools were actually founded for the purpose of teaching children the Bible? That's right. That's how the American school system came into being, into existence? How far we have fallen. Another parallel. Antiochus caused the sacrifices to stop. The book of Maccabees says he caused the lambs to cease. The sacrifices are ultimately all about the lamb, Yeshua. He is the ultimate sacrifice. In the end times, the spirit of, of the Antichrist will war against the lamb. The spirit of the false Messiah wars against Yeshua and the cross and sacrifice and atonement and godliness and holiness and morality, and marriage, and family, and death of self, and covenant commitment, and the Bible. We are to be the people of the Lamb. So how are we to overcome and be victorious for Yeshua in the last days? It says in the book of Maccabees that people consecrated themselves to God. Many actually took Nazarite vows, dedicating themselves wholly to the Lord, separating themselves unto Him, committing themselves to lives of holiness under the Lord. They consecrated the temple, but they first consecrated themselves. Likewise, if you want to stand in the end times, you need to be consecrated. Consecrated to Yeshua. Not that you're going to be perfect, but we need to repent of that. As Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 says, repent of the sin that so easily entangles us, and to run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Him, on Yeshua, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We need to separate ourselves unto Messiah and separate ourselves away from the world. 
If you separate yourself unto Yeshua and away from the world system, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life, you will have victory in the end times. The book of Maccabees recounts how the Syrians advanced on the Maccabees to take revenge upon them. Due to Maccabees, man asked, how can we who are few fight against this mighty army? And this is what it says in the book of Maccabees. It says, uh, Judah says, it's easy for the many to be overcome by the few. In the sight of heaven, there's no difference between deliverance by the many or the few. For victory in war does not depend on the size of the army, but on strength that comes from God. On that day, the Maccabees crushed the Syrian army. They depended not on their own strength or size or resources, but on the power of God. So also in the end times, we have to look not to our own strength or numbers. Do not focus how many are on the enemy's side. Do not look at how great is the apostasy. Don't dwell on all the things that are against you. Just stand faithful to Yeshua and do God's will, and you will have the power of heaven to overcome all things. Yeshua has overcome the world. We have to keep our eyes focused on him. And the Lord will be with you. And that's all that matters. When the Syrians saw the Maccabees' boldness, they fled. And the the Maccabees went up to the temple and cleansed it and rededicated it. We, like the Maccabees, must be a people of boldness. Not arrogance, not pride, but bold in faith. God wants us to become bold in faith, bold in love, bold in sharing the gospel, bold in proclaiming the truth. When the Syrians saw the Maccabees' boldness, they fled. Be bold about the word of God. Yes. Don't be timid. Don't be intimidated. Right. Be bold about the God you serve. Amen. Be bold about the God who gave his life for yes. you. Yes. How does the story end? It ends with redemption. You know, they, they cleanse and they rebuild the temple. How will the coming tribulation end? The Bible says it ends with victory for Messiah and all those who are his. Amen. Remember, no matter how dark it gets, it ends with victory. You win because Yeshua wins. He's coming back to vanquish the foe. It ends with the lighting of the lamp of God, the menorah. Although really, if you think about it, it never went out with the Maccabees. They kept the fire of God burning within them. Because the true oil is the Spirit of God. And the true light is the light of the Lord. And the true lamp that holds the oil, is the body of Messiah, the people of God. And through all the trials and tribulations, the Maccabees kept the lamp burning. And that's what you and I are called to do, to keep the lamp burning, to keep our light shining. When the night comes, the most important thing is to have the light of Yeshua shining within. Do not become overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. At the end of the book of Daniel, it says this in Daniel 12, verse 10. Go your way, Daniel. Many will be purified and made spotless and refined, but the wicked uh, will continue to be wicked. That is the effect of persecution, to purify you and refine you. So do not fear it. Persecution for Yeshua's sake, in the end, if you have the right perspective, will only purify and refine you and make you better. You will become what you were always meant to become. Do you want to be like the first century Book of Acts believers? You can be that, but there's something missing. Persecution. When persecution comes, if you stand with Messiah, it'll forge you into the shining saint that you were meant to be. We're told in Daniel 12, verse 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So when the world grows dark, do not fear. When the dark gets darker, we who are bright must get brighter. When the night comes, the candle burns most bright. So do not fear the darkness of the end times, because that's when the glory comes. You don't light the menorah during the day, do you? You light it at night. Do not fear the sun going down. It only means... It's time for Hanukkah. It's time to let your light shine. When the night comes, when the evil increases, it's time to let your light of the glory of Messiah within you shine forth. When the darkness tries to to censor you, 
from proclaiming the truth of God. It's time to let the light of Yeshua be within you uh, because shine forth. Uh, because his light dispels the darkness, and the darkness must flee. John 1, verse 5. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So when you don't see any light around you, light up. You be that light. The light of Hanukkah, the light of dedication. That's the oil of the Spirit. That's the blaze of glory. It's getting darker around you. Praise God, it's time for Hanukkah. It's time for the world to see the light within you, so don't hide your light under a bushel. Keep the word of God strong within you. Proclaim it to those around you. Keep the faith. It's time, as Isaiah says, Isaiah 60, verse 1, it says it's time to arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. When darkness comes, it's Hanukkah time. Light the lights. Happy Hanukkah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. I'd to call the music team to come on up, please. We're going to stand and pray, and I want the music team to come up. We're going to close with some songs as we, as we, as we close and pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Lord, Father, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, we ask you right now to help us be the lights for you and for your gospel, and we shine more brightly. Help us to fully dedicate our lives to you as we celebrate this feast of dedication. Fill us with your oil of the Holy Spirit. Let us be like the five wise virgins who always were ready for your coming with oil in their lamps. Fill us, Lord Yeshua, right now with your spirit. Let us be lights in this, this ever-growing darker world. Help us not to hide our light under the bushel, but to be bold for you, Yeshua. Lord, we renounce and repent of every dark and shameful way within us. Help us to reflect the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Messiah. You, Lord, you said, let light shine out of darkness. You've made your light, the light of Messiah, shine in our hearts, Lord, to give us the light of the knowledge of your glory displayed in the face of Yeshua. Help us, help our light to shine like the brightness of the heavens that we might partner with you, Lord Yeshua, to lead many to righteousness in you, that they too may shine like the stars forever and ever. If persecution comes, Lord, help me to see it as an opportunity to become more and more like you. Use the persecution, Lord, to refine me and to purify me. Lord, I acknowledge, I cannot, we cannot, Lord, we all acknowledge right now, we cannot be saved without being born again in you. Lord, you tell us you, you must be born again. So, Lord, we commit our life to you, Yeshua. Yes. And if we have committed our life to you in the past, but we're not walking in it, Lord, now we repent of the darkness within us. And we turn to you, Yeshua, because you are the light of the world. And for all of us, Lord, right now, we confess, Lord, that you are calling us today to, a higher, to higher things, yes. to greater things. Yes. So, Lord, we embrace and we yield to that. Lord, we say right now, Hineni, here I am. Send me, Lord. Lord, we say yes to you today. Lord, to so arise and shine within me that my light may shine. And we pray all of this in your name, Yeshua, the light of the world. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Chag Sameach. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.